you had started him in mixed martial arts at that. Uh, no, it was just just, just prior, but just prior. it was it was just gave me the oomph to go and <laughs> to go and do it. <laughs> and um, and I think that that practice has informed a lot of, of what you might talk about today. And um, the reason that I really wanted to invite you to this event. So thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you very much. It's it's, it's lovely to be invited, and um, I I've, I've never. Done anything like this with my leggings and my sweaty t-shirt, <laughs> but it feels it feels appropriate. Um, yeah, I don't know quite how this is going to work, but there is some stuff that I've written that I'm going to read. Um, I've written it in sections in different files, and um, it might well be read in an order that doesn't make any sense. So we'll see. Um, and uh, I don't know. These situations are always a little bit anxious making for me. Uh, because I'm not a scholar. It was very nice to be introduced as a scholar in the text, but I'm, I'm not really a scholar. I'm, I'm an artist of sorts, and um, I make things in a very sort of intuitive uh, way. That's such a great cop-out, isn't it? Um, <laughs> but what it means is that I don't always have the language of theory, even though I sometimes read theory. Um, I'm, I'm also finding at the moment, particularly where I work, um, and particularly with, with uh, students who, who I meet, that there's this kind of um, over canonization um, and that I'm, I'm trying to wiggle away from quite uh, frantically of, of, of theory and, 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 and writers. And I feel like uh, one of the things that um, is so fantastic about today is, is, is that we've been doing a workshop and then I'm still feeling a bit sort of sweaty and um, there's, there's something that's uh, beyond theory, although I often try and talk about theory as practice and practicing or embodying, embodiment of, of theory. Um, so yes, I have, I have words to read, but I'm not sure if there's any sense behind them. Um, but I wanted to use this opportunity today to talk about um, some things that are sort of difficult to find language for. Um, sort of the opposite of what we've just seen, these two remarkable pieces. Um, and I feel like what I want to place in front of you right now is, is the opposite in terms of, um, uh, not that I want to oppose those, not, not in, even in the tiniest bit do I want to oppose either of those pieces, quite the opposite to that as well, but um, I want to position something that's um, a sudden loss of energy, um, as if there's a, a, as if you're standing on the stage on top of the trap door and it suddenly just goes mm -hmm. and you fall completely and absolutely. There's a complete abandonment of energy. There's a, uh, mm -hmm. a moment of it's gone completely. Or, or maybe it's the, a bit like um, the rabbit hole in uh, Alice in Wonderland where there's a, a sort of a, a catastrophic fall uh, into something that is um, also full of um, wonderment. Um, but within that wonderment, there's a sense of um, no oomph, <laughs> no capacity to endure, no um, possibility to uh, push through, um, no metabolic recourse to anything but collapse. Um, and within that, perhaps, uh, a complete loss of reference points and mapping and an ability to chart and find out where you are. So I'm, I'm interested in these states at the moment uh, because they're ones that I physically feel um, very often and um, they're turbulent, they're coming and going and they're kind of uh, dance with um, states of high energy and extraordinary uh, stamina um, and resilience and uh, capacity um, is, is part of being 50, being female and being 50. And uh, realizing that, um, you know, as I, I sort of hit 45, 
and my body began to change and my mind began to change and my sort of reality began to change, um, I realized that I, there, there wasn't a conversation going on around this, around uh, being perimenopausal um, and then, you know, the horizon of menopause that uh, was particularly interesting to me. It was a conversation generally about um, doom, gloom, dread, suffering, um, devastation, um, and, I, and I felt a very sort of determined kind of excitement to uh, try and write another sort of narrative and to find another framing and to find another sort of um, articulation and, and way of working with my body as, a, as I began to um, change in ways that were um, about getting very lost. And a lot of women I, I talk to, we, we have this kind of a language of um, being out at sea uh, without any, any sort of navigationary sort of tools or, or technology, um, the sense of, uh, and I find these images um, very powerful, very exciting to work with, very inspiring. So I have a sort of ongoing, um, quiet, uh, unofficial uh, project which is, which is this idea of reframing menopause. Um, and sometimes I think about a sort of possibility of um, hacking menopause. But hacking is, is a word that's um, very associated with a very sort of blokey, male-dominated um, <laughs> maker culture, which is fantastic. Uh, nothing wrong with that at all. But there's, a, there's, a, there's another kind of possibility, I think, of, of looking at that. What is it to tinker and what is it to, um, to work into something, to sort of intervene into and, and, and delve into and look at the mechanisms and mechanics of and to perhaps work in other ways. So, so that's where some of this is coming from. Um, for the last sort of 20 years or something, you know, I've been making performance art with a certain amount of endurance and duration, um, and I've been really fascinated and uh, enthralled and, and charmed by those terrains, those terrains of exhaustion and working with time and working with tasks. Um, But I'm, I'm trying to see if there's, if there's something else I can do now with the same sort of integrity that allows other sort of registers uh, of embodiment and also affective registers as well. Um, what else to say about that? The other thing I wanted to say, um, so this, the title is, is Muscle Pause Poesis. Um, muscle I'll talk quite a bit about um, in, in the, these readings, but quite a lot of what I've been doing over the last 20 years is, is uh, working at the interface between um, art and science, and particularly biology. Um, and so and so there's a whole area of practice, that huge developing, burgeoning um, area of practice that um, isn't perhaps always explicitly performance art, but has, um, huge questions that, that it presents around what a body is, what bodies are, uh, what our relationships are to um, other aspects of vitality and what's living, and that might be to um, non-human animals, it might be to molecules, to um, other, rela other relationships to time, um, other critters, as Donna Haraway would say. Um, and so what I think about is relational bodies. So that feels like something very fundamental to sort of open up these conversations to relationships, relationships across bodies and bodies coming into being through those relationships, relationships across scale and across durations, um, and relationships with things and particles and um, different processes, chemical processes, biochemical processes. Um, materials and so on. So I'll just do some readings, maybe chat a little bit more and um, and then maybe if, if you're moved to ask a question or, or if you have a comment, um, 
In a way, I sort of wish I could see you. I've been so used to seeing you all day. I can sort of see you, but not very well. You're a little bit hidden. Um, but it's, it's okay. It's just been a nice kind of um, conviviality from not having anything too sort of staged. Um, and something I try and work with a lot, or have worked with a lot. Oh, thank you. That's perfect. It's, it's just proximity and uh, being able to maybe catch people's eye to feel that sense of, you know, closeness. So this is kind of, this might really go a bit, a bit wrong, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Sweat protocol number one. Be menopausal, go to bed, throw off the covers. I'm trying to build muscle mass. Pause. I read somewhere that it is the best thing to do for a woman of my age. Pause. Rather than head down the road of hormone replacement therapy just yet, I'm trying to manipulate and work with my own physiology and hormonal well-being. Pause. Coach really does not appear to like me referring to the menopause. <laughs> Pause. And I'm sure unintentionally treats me as more frail with less capacity than I have. Pause. I try to explain that skillful coaching of perimenopausal and menopausal women is an untapped market right for the picking. Pause. That helping women architect muscle to support their well-being as they transition into menopause and its post is a terrific idea. Pause. I feel a little bit condescended to pause. But not quite enough to put me off. He wants me to Instagram my visits to Jim. <laughs> I don't want to, but perhaps if I hashtag menopause. Pause. I talk with the artist Castles about my efforts. Pause. in a cocktail bar in Los Angeles. Pause. Wishing that I could train with them, their career as a personal trainer as well as an artist, sees them work with, with amongst other people, transgender clients. Pause. and whose embodiment of their gender is realized in many and various ways, most particularly through training and weight lifting. Pause. With Castles in LA, we talk a little about how to navigate the turbulence of midlife change and the intensity of its potentialities. Pause. They understand. Pause. 
I explained that I want to understand the muscular influence on metabolic operations and endocrine pathways, and so calibrate my own hormone profiles. Pause. Castles talks about Diane Nyad, who at 60, or around 60, swam from Cuba to Florida after numerous attempts. Pause. Castles referred to training programs that Diane Nyad created for menopausal women that I've not been able to find. Pause. I read more about muscle mass and muscle loss Quote, the regulation of muscle mass is of interest to a diverse group of people. There are those, such as power athletes and bodybuilders, who are primarily interested in increasing their muscle mass. Others are concerned with preventing muscle loss. This is critical for the frail elderly, whose myopathies, with, sorry, those with myopathies, cancer, sepsis, HIV AIDS, and other diseases. Those suffering from reduced mobility as a result of injury and astronauts. End quote. Pause. Astronaut. Pause. Pause or not? Pause. Astro Pause. Artist Mary Magic performs another kind of hormonal hack. She articulates herself in terms of body and gender as continually shifting in response to environmental toxicities, endocrine disruptors, and embraces the unintentionalities and instabilities they cause and create. She works with estrogen. Pause. DIY emancipation of estrogen using domestic and lay scientific protocols towards more participatory distribution of estrogen. She asks, quote, what is the feasibility of system, citizen science-based approach to synthesizing hormones? How can the recontextualization of laboratory biochemistry to an open source recipe, outline the esoteric procedures and knowledge that are required to carry out such a process. End quote. Pause. She runs workshops on estrogen detection. Pause. Inquiring of the pervasiveness of Estrocentricity. Pause. For estrogenicity is no longer limited to a small group of substances, but can be found in a whole series of chemical classes and used daily in agriculture, industrial manufacturing, health, etc. Since the end of World War II, more than 10,000 active substances capable of estrogen activity have been released on the market and used in hydraulic or geoelectric fluids for capacitators and transformers, glues, paints, detergents, insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, cosmetics, etc. Pause. We will ask multiple questions says Mary Magic. For example, can we make our own hormones for contraception? What are the ethical implications in self-administering DIY hormones? How to detect the presence of hormones in the environment? How to design sensors that will play a role in citizen, anal citizen analysis of local water? Can we eliminate hormonal toxicity from the environment? Pause.
Ava Haywood describes the open potentials of the endocrine landscape created by our medications and industrial common materials. One in which our shared evolutionary history with other animals creates a shared vulnerability to the effects of these environments. She says, quote, Hormone levels change over an individual's lifetime and are affected by lifestyle, stress, physical activity, and exogenous hormones. Even natural plant sub substances like phytoestrogens interact with the endocrine system of various animals. Our material culture, as expressed by what objects we encircle ourselves with, the food we eat, the water we drink, end quote. Haywood invokes Bailey Keir's perspective, in which he attends to the ecologically constitutive nature of bodies. He refers to bodies as constant processes, relations, adaptions, and metabolisms, engage in varying degrees of reproductive economic relations with multiple other bodies, substances, and things. End quote. Pause. Astro. Pause. Digging into the tinkering of muscle, its metabolic and hormonal sensitivities. Pause. I lift. Pause. I breathe. Pause. My mind turns to my breath. My mind watches my breath. Pause. My mind turns and watches my breath. Pause. My mind turns and faces my breath. Pause. My mind faces my breath. Pause. My mind studies my breath. Pause. My mind sees every aspect of the beauty of my breath. Pause. My mind watches my breath soothing itself. Pause. My mind sees every part of my breath. Pause. My breath is not indifferent to itself. Sweat Protocol 2. Hold copper pipe closely in the heat of the day under the hot sun. Glisten. Kizahale is a sports center and is a vital institution in the Helsinki milieu and useful to think about as part of a social and cultural ecosystem. I've never been there during the day time before. In the evening, it is full of flights of small girls cheerleading and doing gymnastics. Weights being shifted in the weights room, mostly by men. Sweaty Brazilian jiu-jitsu training, agile, fencing, languid tai chi. The bonhomie, the bonhomie of table tennis, generally older gentlemen. On the mezzanine, there are solo dancers rehearsing swings, swing, somehow. Break dancers working out balances and swivels and countly small combinations of bodies and technologies of the body. It's a relational space of worlds becoming. It holds histories, both intimate ones of individual exertion and effort and meta ones of national sports histories. It's a bit battered, paint is peeling. There are weights that look as if they predate the building. Other processes, other processes are at play at other scales, microbial, biochemical. Human bodies exert sweat, steam, and drip. Microbes proliferate on bodies and on surfaces, finding nourishing niches in which to metabolize and expand. Weights rust. Sweat clouds precipitate. Seemingly immovable materials oxidize and react. Embedded in our human cells, Symbiogenetic mito mitochondria 
mosaic organelles of bacterial provenance from an origin evolutionary E metabolites. Muscle fibers fire and twitch in various tempos. Satellite stem cells are signaled. They differentiate, line up into multinuclear myotubes. Fibers are formed and muscle is laid. Kathy Acker counts. Sweat protocol three. Hold iron kettlebell. Perform swings energetically. Sweat calls kettlebell to rust. Locating academic bruises. Currently, I teach at the Theatre Academy of the University of the Arts in Helsinki, otherwise known as TEAC, which stands for something I still can't pronounce quite <laughs> or convincingly enough yet in Finnish. I moved there at the beginning of last year, knowing very little of the context I was stepping into, its culture or its history. Um, so I'm running a completely new program. It's a pilot. It might never happen after it's finished again, who knows, um, but the, the Theatre Academy um, traditionally is taught uh, very much on skills base, so there's acting, directing, dramaturgy, dance, choreography, um, dance pedagogy, theatre pedagogy, um, and then there's my program, which is more orientated towards um, ideas, and also a live art and performance studies program, which is similarly not in the skills side in the same way. On my very first visit to Teak, I was given a tour of the beautiful building. Beneath the tori, the huge glass roof lobby area, I spied a gym and asked to see it. It's a recently created gym, provided primarily for the students, but faculty and administration staff are also welcome to use it. The gym was established by Seppo Kumpalainen, an acting professor at the school, who's been responsible for the education of voice and movement, acrobatics, stage and stage fights for some decades. So he's just about to retire. He's been there for such a long time. Um, Seppo was a new teacher during the time of Yuko Turka, the former headmaster of the Theatre Academy, whose extreme and authoritarian approach to a highly demanding physical training for acting, acting students has left a conflicted legacy which has felt to me as if I had ended, as I have entered the academy, like a tender bruising. In his 2012 paper, From Sweat and Tears Towards Sweat and Harmony, Seppo recounts the use of the Cooper test to assess new students' fitness when they first enrolled. If they were not able to pass, they were not permitted to progress into further studies which normally would be um, a production that uh, Turka would create with the students across all years. So they had to um, pass the Cooper test in order to progress into working with him. So effectively, if they couldn't pass, they were stuck, they were stymied. Um, Seppo was responsible for running the test. Eventually, as a cohort of students repeatedly failed, he began to alter the results in the students' favor, falsifying them. He says, quote, Turka, who emphasized masculinity and authoritarianism, seemed to think I was a kind of sports teacher he wanted for this program, male, young, and fit. Turka's demand to use the Cooper test as a tool of power in a manner that I in a manner that I found unethical, eventually led me to a personal moral crisis in the autumn of 1987, when I falsified the students' Cooper test results for their benefit. Seppo describes how Turku was concerned to foster competitiveness amongst his students, that they should be willing to suffer as shown by the male sports heroes typically admired in Finland at that time. All actors should embody the spirit of these types of heroes so that the audience could admire, respect, and look up to them. Seppo felt compelled by his own ethics to alter the results in defiance of Turka's regime, 
and pedagogical philosophy, and for 20 years maintained complete secrecy about this. Which is a really long time. Gradually, as the atmosphere in the academy became more convivial and teaching became more student-centered, Seppel wrote about his experience. However, interestingly, Seppel kept the Cooper test in his training for acting students, but positioned it more as a marker of development and empowered students to use it as a bar for them to measure their progress on their own terms. He became convinced of the need for active consideration and empowerment of acting students and to work with principles of cooperation and collaboration <coughs> rather than Tulka's insistence on competition. I meet students in the gym. I train alongside them. Indeed, I imagine holding seminars in there and I try to engage students in discussion about how they're working with their bodies and why. Mostly, though, we simply train alongside one another. I see them push themselves hard, striving. They see me in red-faced and wild-haired twirl. Sweat Protocol 4. Wear a white cotton mutated lab coat to the gym at work. Run and or row into a heavy sweat. Use the coat to absorb the sweat. Bury the sweaty coat in a wild area in the hope that sympathetic microbes will grow on the sweat. muscle culture. Between 2008 and 2010, I spent a lot of time in a laboratory in the University of Birmingham. I was there to research and experiment with, grow with growing muscle cells on spider silk. I worked with murine skeletal muscle cell lines and primary cell cultures, also mouse. I learned to observe and note their differentiation pathways their minuscule architecting as satellite cells receive signals to differentiate and form the multinuclei myotubes that compose muscle fibers. I learned how to cultivate the cells, prodding them, nudging them in their tissue culture flasks and 98 well plates, tiny muscular entities occulted and excluded from any body. Sometimes we would visit the animal facility where non-human animals are bred, housed, and culled for research. A number of mice specifically bred, normally dystrophic, would be killed or sacrificed as quickly and efficiently as possible. I think humanely is the word. Before tiny biopsies were extracted for cultivation. The lab was concerned with the tragic degenerative effects of Duchenne muscular dystrophy and with how to address this in human patients. It explored the molecular mechanisms of muscular dystrophy and investigated the genetics, hormones, and other cell signalers that created its disruption of the differentiation lineages. The anarchic rationale that created exquisite-looking muscle cultures, spindle-like webs, clumps, and masses that refused the lineal logic of myotube construction. Cell cultivation and the many methods of inquiry take routine, care, and precision. Regularity, observation, adjustment. The research group was tiny, and at the time, there was just one PhD student, Dean. Dean was a former bodybuilder who still trained. Every day, he consumed, with unassuming regularity, from a series of Tupperware containers chicken and rice, protein drinks, building his muscle mass, architecting his muscle on the growth scale. I could never establish if there was a connection for him between his muscle research work on the micro 
and his muscle cultivation on the macro. However, steadfast regularity was evident in both. The senior researcher, Janet, would show me how to peer at cells, how to sense their condition, how to be delicate, and how to be precise. In the dimly lit tissue culture lab, amidst the pink flasks of muscle, she would tell me about long journeys she made by cross-country ski. I practiced yoga, I cycled. My yoga practice was diligent and disciplined under the tutelage of the ever-witty teacher and her seniority in yogic arts. I learned how to fall downstairs very, very slowly in a cascade of backward movements deeply informed by yoga technique. Nude shoulder stands descending with considerable muscular control. Deep core muscles lifting me before releasing and folding back into another phase of slow fall. Backyard. I work on deadlifts and front squats. In her essay, Language of the Body, Kathy Acker writes, I want to shock my body into growth. I do not want to hurt it. She says, I visualize and I count. I estimate weight. I count sets. I count repetitions. I count seconds between repetitions. I count seconds or minutes between sets from the beginning to the end of each workout in order to maintain intensity, I just continually count." End quote. I put on Robert Ashley's 24-minute track, The Backyard, from his exquisite seven-part opera for television made sometime between 1978 and 1983. His hypnotic voice slowly utters, my mind turns to my breath, one. My mind watches my breath, two. My mind turns and watches my breath, three. My mind and faces my breath, four. My mind faces my breath, five. My mind studies my breath, six. My mind sees every aspect of the beauty of my breath, seven. My mind watches my breath soothing itself, eight. My mind sees every part of my breath. Nine. My breath is, no, is not indifferent to itself. Ten. She never thinks of possibilities or how probably it is that they have come together. These thoughts never enter her mind. Nor do thoughts of sports. She has no desire to improve her muscles. For her, piano playing is the only mystery. Sweat, meteorologery, <laughs> sorry. Horses sweat, men perspire, women glow. <laughs> I do not mind the arrival of sudden night sweats, the flashlight floods drenching me despite their disruptive drama. Rather, I enjoy their excessiveness and sense of abandon. I did not mind being sodden, somehow it was satisfying, intense and tropical. I'm not sure what you said. <laughs> Great time. <laughs> I will repeat. <laughs> Perhaps I found myself unbothered because I was used to sweating like a horse. There was a moment sometime prior to the onset of hormonal deluges when I announced that I sweated like a man when I trained. There was nothing restrained or glowing about my salty deluges. I poured unrelentingly until sodden. My face went red, my hair all over the place. I precipitated, misted, and formed clouds. It was when I used to train at KO Gym in Bethnal Green. At some point in my early 40s, I decided that I wanted to learn grappling, which was kind of around the time when we did that workshop. I was headed in that direction, and shortly afterwards, off I went to KO Gym. Uh, which took me to Keio Gym, where there was Muay Thai, no gi Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and wrestling. For the most part, I trained under the mixed martial arts coach 
James Duncalf, pretty quickly dropping kickboxing so that I could focus on grappling with the hope of making some progress. Classes were generally mixed, beginners quickly progressing to the next level, an intermediate class. Um, all genders training together, the majority being male and young. Some women did train, particularly Anna Zucchelli and Simona Supukova, both great fighters and competitors in Muay Thai and MMA. Um, and I should add that uh, at that time, it was a really exciting moment in um, the sort of larger global stage of mixed martial arts, um, namely the UFC, and that women were just about that time uh, beginning to compete in the UFC for the first time. So I'd been training for a while, and then there was the first fight. I guess I'd started in the autumn, and it was something like early the following year, I can't remember which year it was, um, that Ronda Rousey and Liz Kamush um, competed in UFC, being the first woman. Um, and this was a, a very exciting, very inspiring, um, and it seemed to kind of um, support a conversation that we were having in the gym anyway, that everybody seemed to be having in the gym anyway, particularly Anna and Simona and myself. Simona was also beginning to fight for uh, Invicta, which is the, um, um, a US-based uh, promoter for women's MMA. So it felt like there was a lot going on, and Anna was doing really well, and uh, the whole team was really behind these women. Um, there were also a lot of other women who were competing out of KO in uh, women who were um, competing in kickboxing and Muay Thai. Um, so it was a very interesting time to be there and, and, and have conversations about uh, what it is to train, what it is to do combat sports on any level. You know, so there was you know the sort of incredibly inexperienced amateurs and uh, people who were really, in a way, far too old to do anything very effective like myself. But there was a real sense of um, acceptance and encouragement, irrespective of, sort of age, gender, where you're from, what you look like, what your body type, you know, anything. It was a very, very interesting place at the time. Um, the culture of BJJ appeared to value effort, consistency, and commitment more than any natural talent or given capacity. Training sessions would consist of warm-up, technique, and 30 minutes of five-minute rounds of sparring. Friday nights were open mat night. In other words, just sparring. Within the intimate embrace of BJJ, we traded sweat, chokes, and holes. Um, and I was generally grappling with someone who I would tease and say I'm old enough to be your mother, um, which I thought would give me an advantage, which it never particularly did. Um, Generally, I was flat on my back, trying to escape someone's side control, crushing top game, because normally there was someone a lot bigger than me, and I wasn't very skillful um, at escaping. Or being flurried about by James's agile and playful game of sweeps and delicate butterfly guard. Exertion, exhilaration, and pure fun, as well as tears, feeding the fascination with biomechanics, movement, and flow. I'd found myself disenchanted with the careful practices of contact improvisation, and I realized I'm terribly unfair about contact improvisation and its, its aesthetics, uh, but, but perhaps found something of its original vision here in the chest-like maneuvers of control, escape, and submission. Martin Hargreaves, who was at the time in, at Laban, meeting the MA in the body of performance, urged me to return to contact's genesis in Paxton's original work, Magnesium with wrestlers on mats with dairy. In grappling, there was something essential and very simple, despite the sophistication of an evolving and constantly developing game of innovation of technique. At the end of each training session, we stood in line, ready to make our final hoofs. We would, we would pour, sweat, perspire, glow, forming a microclimate for our, from our embraces and exertions. Humidities were suspended to the uncladded railway arch roof often to return to liquid state and cool on the mats as cold, briny puddles. Cold and rather disgusting. Sweat, blossom and rolls. As I des descended into the subway, every pore gushed and I became unrelenting liquid. What had been my crisp, cotton, leopard print frock and its figure-hugging fit held me in dampness. My face blossomed in redness as I took a seat on the train. 
I had showered following training and emerged from the sweaty grappling class smart and put together before heading to the subway to go uptown. The BJJ class at Marcelo Garcia's was in his smart Chelsea gym in Manhattan. I tumbled through it, feeling disorientated, inspired, overawed. I don't remember what techniques we learnt, but I remember the euphoria of the judo rolls from standing over one another in quick succession. Rolls always feel like a threat to my long neck. <laughs> and what can feel like brittleness, particularly as I age, and feel like a sort of ossification as minerality and dryness. But, the, but these rolls were without mind, there was no room for doubt. Rolls can feel bumpy and tense, knobbly and unskillful, one side being easier than the other. On the right side, I know, I know that my thinking anticipates and, and an image of my rolling, and then I execute it, and it happens. On the left side, I think it, and it's if there is some kind of lapse and amnesia and no idea how to do it. Last week I leapt into judo rolls from standing, performing them in quick succession, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left. My left side knew what to do, and everything felt smooth and soft. How? I do not know. A bit like today. And I think that's everything. I think I'm going to stop. Mm -hmm. Great. We have a little bit of time for some questions. Um, the use of the word um, citizen. Uh, you mentioned hacktivist. Oh, yeah. And so I was interested in the nomenclature around the agency around what has previously been termed as, you know, in other fields, amateur or hobbyist, but this, this, this label of citizen analysis or citizen, kind of this um, non-specialist role, mm. um, and the, the use of the word citizen and, and the power they're in or possibly the mislabeling they're in if it's about um, uh, kind of Citizen seems very power laden, I guess, mm -hmm. and I'm interested in that word choice as opposed to the many other things that have been thrown around, um, like hobbyist, amateur, hacktivist, and stuff like that. But yeah, it's, it's it comes. I think citizen science was is being the expression that's been given to non scientists who are who are doing doing science out of the institutions mm -hmm. and separate from. So so the pathway I came through was through um, artists working with biology, often. Um, often within, but not exclusive, exclusively within um, institutions where science is practiced. Mm. And then there's this, but normally for some kind of artistic um, end point or, or, or reason. And citizen science, um, it's certainly not my term, it's, it's, it's a term that I, as far as I know, has come from the United States and has a different sort of emphasis. And it seems to be that sometimes it arises in different forms, so it might be used in terms of um, people who want to tinker at home in their home lab and try and work with some really sophisticated but available mm -hmm. genetic editing, like currently it's, the conversations are around genetic editing CRISPR. protocols like CRISPR-Cas9. Yeah. Um, but sometimes citizen science is also used as, you know, when a science institution or research project might want to harness a uh, sort of collective use, like people working on their laptops, their home, their home computers, or whatever, or yeah, yeah. people to work with something environmental, like perhaps counting or doing field work yeah. or spotting or doing something around pollution or whatever. So it's used in different ways, and I think Mary Magic is using it. Um, the sense I get from her is that she wants to look at power relations. And, and who owns what, and that's why she's using DIY culture. I mean, she's, she's actually, um, her background is, is um, she trained as a scientist and now works in media arts, and she's currently at the MIT Media Lab, of which she is happy to be there, but very, very critical as well of the power relations there, um, and who funds MIT Media Lab and so on, and the whole transhumanist thing. Um, so I find her, She's one of the artists I'm most inspired by at the moment and excited by because um, she's 
very smart, she's very careful with what she makes, and she's continually thinking about power and relations too. So it's Mary Magic with two G's at the end. And um, just some really great, great you know, YouTube lectures as well as a very good website. Um, so she's using the expre expression system of science when she's talking about um, the DIY uh, estrogen um, detection stuff. In terms of the estrogen balance to no one on call, so I was just I was actually just making some notes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a, a question that perhaps touches on what you used to do as a pro wrestler. Yeah. And, um, because your examples, um, and I think it, it, it suits the background in terms of as a performance artist, but they're, they're about performance and thinking about the, the idea of the real. And the real examples are about biology and muscle, hormones, etc. And um, I think coming from another background, I, I often think about what theatricality is. Mm. And it's something that's supplementary. I think that I used that word earlier. It's, it's like the exclamation mark. But at the same time, so it's, it seems indefinable, but at the same time, um, despite our want often to think of the theatrical as something unreal, I think it is a very real state to mm -hmm. occupy. I wondered how that f fits in. In terms of wrestling, because we, we know pro wrestling is incredibly real, but it's also incredibly theatrical, and that's the thing that leads people to denigrate it. So, yeah. I, one thing, sorry, this is what I was making another thing about yeah. the menopause women as well. One thing I did want to touch upon is um, the use of um, sort of certain substances to pro prolong health because it's been used in the aesthetics so much. So, if you say something to them about like sort of growth hormone or steroids and such like, very much vilified as a cheating tool, mm -hmm. but if it's something like a hormone replacement therapy or testosterone, testosterone replacement therapy, it's still clouded in so much. Um, oh, if you're doing that, then you're, you're cheating your body in some way, but to actually, because it's still so clouded, there's lots of people not, not really know what they're doing, and it's because it's just always seen as the aesthetic thing, but it's actually, no, it's going to promote longevity in the body, and there's a lot of stuff that won't just manifest itself on the outside. And it's interesting you're touching on that. Because well, it's, it, it, it's huge because it completely overlaps with uh, performance enhancement, health, yes. um, gender, but also sex as well. Yes. Um, and there's very little, I think, I think you know, I, I listen to a lot of really crappy uh, MMA podcasts. Can't help that I do. The fact, they fascinate me. It's, it's normally the thing that you know that sort of staying in touch with the narrative of you know whatever and whoever's trash talking whatever, um, <laughs> and uh, it's gripping stuff. But uh, and so you know you, you hear these different kind of um, uh, stories or these different ways of uh, of, of how um, perhaps you know someone like Cyborg, you know, who will never ever be forgiven for doping once or whatever mm. it was, you know. And often the criticisms of her is uh, manliness, so it becomes this sort of, you know, sort of rigid binary, rather than a discussion of a continuum and constant possibilities. And the, and the reason why I wanted to include this quote from Eva Hayward is because she's trying to write about toxicity and endocrine disruption um, in the environment. You know, the sort of environment sort of uh, catastrophes, and and yet sort of write. Try, and there are a few other people doing this at the moment, trying to write about sort of living with and being with and, and how can we uh, open up possibilities and open up continuums rather than have bi binaries. Um, and, that, and that plays out on the molecular sort of level. And I suppose that's... So, so for me, there, there are kind of these different things that I follow that all seem to talk to the same sort of areas of of relational bodies somehow and, and how those intersect between the actual physicality and then how that also plays out culturally and in terms of, um, I don't know, in terms of, of performance and in terms maybe of some, some kind of theatricality. But certainly always the sort of materiality of the body and, and of bodies has been really, really crucial to me and seems to continue and that's why I'm sort of following through my own sort of personal investigation, also these other writings, trying to think about, you know, almost, you know, menopause is something environmental as well. How can this sort of do a dance? But at the same time, think about how can training in weightlifting also be my version of a kind of hormonal um, hacking, 
yeah. or manipulation and and you know thinking about getting into the nitty gritty of that as well as the kind of um, not just not just the sort of health benefits but the fascination and the ownership of that perhaps mm -hmm. and that being that being something super interesting to me but also to position that at, you know I, I train at work I go to Kizahali sometimes which is fabulous but most of the time I go to work so to position that you know I'm a lot older than anyone else in the gym and then it sits alongside these conversations and these histories and you know I'll talk to Seppo and say it'd be really great if we could do something a bit like you've organized today um, and I had didn't realize until for ages about a lot of these ideas of wanting to work with the gym have this sort of dark history of people being very distressed and I think you know we probably need a big conference there or something to unpack because they're also fascinating you know what was good and what was not so good um, and Seppo is so fantastic at talking about at talking about it as well. So I don't know if that makes sense, but it's trying to put this patchwork or, or trying to sort of describe a terrain. So I haven't really answered your question very well. You know the interesting thing, I think it did, because the, 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 the discourse of, around um, performance enhancement is always like, and especially in things like uh, wrestling, yes. is, is, is always thinking about st um, steroids or, or any sort of um, performance enhancement as um, theatrical, as if that, like the real action of, ch of changing yeah, biology is, not, yeah. is, is, yeah. is not real. So it's interesting, it's like it's a discursive thing, it functions, mm -hmm. I'm thinking very much in Tikai's terms right now, mm -hmm. theatricality is, it's, it's not, it, it, it's, it exists in language just more than anything else. It was, yeah, I, I think something sort of to your point, a bit, well, uh, if this is what I'm going to sort of try, but if you're, I was actually talking about this the other night about almost like from me moving from something that's like you say it's fake, but yet yeah, there's lots of injuries that I've taken in the ring while, and then at the same time, so it's, it's if it's a theatrical event where they, you can have to manage real pain, and then moving over to performance art where it all feels very honest, and I wouldn't say theatric theatricality is frowned upon, but if you feel like you are doing a fake emotion or you're somehow cheating the uh, action you're doing, but to that point, a lot of the time for me it's like, if the work you're doing is producing a real emotion in the audience, like for instance almost watching a film, you know at the end that no actors have really died during that film, but if it has gathered that emotion from you and produced a change and you maybe you found something about yourself, is there really a difference between the two moments? That's something I've been sort of trying to work with quite a lot. If it actually is producing the emotion you're looking for from the audience, or the audience are feeling that, is that really a cheat? I guess. But then the danger is then you get into that thing of, well, what is it to be honest? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. to be yeah, authentic. And it's, hole, yeah, yeah, and it's like, well, I mean, that's never interested me at all. <laughs> <laughs> it really hasn't. It's been much more um, task-based and interesting, formal, technical. And then whatever else flows, then it happens. But mm. it's, it's much more concerned with, um, you know, that's what was so great about the workshop today, that it was, it was um, about learning something and then trying to do it, but very much about that mental uh, approach, you know, when you said, just don't think about it, mm. you know, mm. then it was a lot easier to do. And, and I think it's similar. There's something about, okay, I have the materials, I have the possibility, I have yeah. the time. And then something else has to, and that's partly why um, it's used by Seppo in acting training mm -hmm. because he what, he really does want actors to have that moment of just don't think it, just just do it. Mm -hmm. you yeah. know? So it's yeah. something that we see a lot in the gym at the academies. Um, actors do them, well, two of them really do it. <laughs> and I think when I do press them, say, why do you train so much? I think I think they are a bit like you. They'll say, well, because I love it, and I do it for its own sake, sort of thing, which is. Legit, I think. Yeah. Is there is one final question? Okay, so um, thank you, Kira. Um, and thank you very much to everybody um, today.